morgen, dames en heren. Het is een echte plezier hier te spreken. Probably I should continue in English. Uh, I don't speak more, more, I can only say two sentences in Dutch. So, I'm a school teacher. I want to, uh, I'm always stressed by the fact that we claim that the problem with technologies in school is teachers. Uh, teachers are not able to use the technology. And what if our technology were not good, were not designed for teachers? So that's the point I will try to defend. But to prove that I'm professor of computer science, I made this. This is advanced computer science. <laughs> so my point of view is that we should, because I'm also a computer scientist, professor of computer science, we should develop technologies that, that uh, help teachers to teach and not spoil their life. And because I'm professor of computer science, a journalist called me and say, oh, at EPFL, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, are you going to replace teachers by robots? I tried to give a smart answer, then no, that never goes through. There is only one answer, is yes. Let's do that, let's replace all teachers by robots. And once we've done that, it's very easy. We also replace all learners by robots, and then everything is solved. We can go to the beach and all the problems are solved. Okay, that's not exactly what I want to develop today. We develop other kinds of robots. This is a robot that encourages kids to tidy up their room. Every time they put the toy back in the box, the robot is happy. And you see on the right that human intelligence has still defeated machine intelligence. This is a robot for learning to write. This, we take kids with problems writing and say, now has to pass a test. Can you help now to prepare this test? Learning by teaching, the protege effect. Kids concentrate for one hour, trying to help now to write correctly. That's the kind of technology we do. We're not going to replace teacher. We want to empower teacher. And to explain this, let me go in another world, the world of vocational education. What have these three people in common? The, the CEO of, of UBS, our minister of defense, uh, of finance now, and the founder of the Montreux Jazz Festival. What do they have in common? They learned a job when they were 16. Apprenticeship, Berufsbildung, this is the core of the Swiss education. Two thirds of teenager at 16, they learn a job, four days per week in a company, one day per week at school. And we decide to work with them and to help them developing technology. So we work with logistic assistants, people who move boxes in a warehouse and went to interview 10 of them in 10 companies to see what do they learn when they are in the company. Honestly, not much. It's a great system. The dual system is really the basic of the economy. But when you interview them, well, lo logistics, they have to learn logistics. Logistics is, for instance, if you sell a product every day, you put it very close to the trucks. If you sell a product once per month, you sell it in the back of the warehouse. This kind of thing, the optimization of warehouse. That's not the job of an apprentice. An apprentice moves the box as fast as possible. So how do you, can you teach logistics to these guys? They hate physics, mathematics, logic, statistics. They hate everything with an X at the end. And suddenly you have to teach sta um, logistics to them. So we developed these augmented reality systems where they build the warehouse by placing plastic shelves on the table. And the system will beam information on the top this is augmented reality, digital information being added on physical objects. So this is how it starts. Um, first, the teacher set up the lesson, no login, no HTTP, just put a piece of paper. This is where the truck leaves, where the trucks arrive. And for instance, here, and the, the, the shelves were too close to each other so that forklift could not turn between them. So that's my lesson. It's the lesson here you see different values being updated. It's a lesson on storage <laughs> surface. And um, they can try different, they have to optimize the storage surface. So to maximize the number of goods they can store in their warehouse. So they can try different things. And once they are done, they can uh, run the simulation. And you see the forklift, they go, they take the boxes in, in the trucks, they bring into the shelf and vice versa. Here on the back, on the, on the sheet of paper, there is the average time to bring a box from the shelf to the truck, that's the performance of your warehouse. But with this case, you don't talk about optimizing performance. You make a warehouse 
to get, you build it together. So various activities such as how to load the truck in the reverse order of deliveries while managing the truck center of gravity, for instance. And um, simple things like the lever slow or the most difficult thing for them, which is stock management. Like if you wait, you have no more strawberry before to reorder strawberries, you have no strawberry to sell for two days and so on and so on. Okay, super cool technology. The teams of three, four lamps in the classroom, teams of three, they play with this, they like it a lot. And the teachers like it because they say, we managed to explain things we could not explain. But do they learn? So we did the first experiment in a, in a lab, control study, where we compare teams working with plastic shelf with exactly the same software run on a multi-touch table. And yes, they learn more with the tangible. It's just easy, you move them. It's not like, like doing drag and drop on, on, on a, a touch screen. It's easy, you go fast, you try different solutions. But when we went to the school and tried to compare two classes, one with our super cool technology and one with the traditional paper method, no, significant difference. In my lab, we, did, we invent a lot of very cool technologies. We go to school, we cry. We come back to the lab, we improve the technology, we return to school, we cry a bit less, and after a few loops, then we have a PhD and we drink some wine. That's it. So what happened there? What happened is that if you see here a good group, they discuss a lot the solution they have to do. While here, no discussion at all. They just play. They just they move shelf, run, move, run, move, run, move, run. You can do that for, for centuries, you will never learn anything. There was no reflection, no, no difficult um, activity of trying to understand. They were just playing this thing too. Playing is not enough. It gives you experience, but experience is not knowledge. To turn experience into knowledge, you need to reflect, expect, predict, understand. So we had to give this key to the teacher. The teacher is working in the classroom. There are four tables, four lamps like that about 15 students, and the students cannot run the simulation anymore. They can move the shell, they have to call the teacher. Sir, can I run the simulation? And the, the teacher has this card. To run the simulation, they have to sh it has to show the, co the card to the lamp, and then they will be able to run, but they are not able to run. Sir, uh, the teachers come and say, well, do you believe that this way rose will be faster than the previous one? These are teenagers, I say, oh. We don't, well, we don't know. Well, think about it and call me. Call me when you know. Sir, sir, yes. Yeah, you, uh, it, will be, it will be faster? Uh -huh. Why? <laughs> well, we don't know. Well, think about it and call me. Call me when you know. Okay. So we had to give this key to the teachers so the teacher could force the kids to think about, to reflect, to predict. Uh, just then he would just turn the card and they would run the simulation. He had also another one. Pause the class, he showed this one and all the lamps become white. So he can give a two minutes explanation. You know, when you have a, a kids with a, an iPad in your classroom and you try to get attention from them, it takes two minutes. If this happened five times in a, in, a, in a lesson of 50 minutes, that's terrible, it's made 10 minutes, 20% of the lesson time just to be able to speak a little bit. So this, he showed this, all the lamps become white, he can explain for two seconds, he turned the, and so on. So we had to empower the teacher. Also, we gave him tools to be able to compare what is going on in the four lamps in the classroom and so on. And finally, with this, we managed to obtain significant results. So we had a very cool technology, which was making the life of the teacher a bit more difficult. It was too engaging. He had to disengage the learners with these things. So we had to give the, the, we had to give the teacher the power to disengage. When you give iPads to the kid, you spoil the life of the teacher. You introduce an enemy in the class. Les enfants, les enfants, please. Les, 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 arrête, Jean-Michel. Les enfants. No, you make it very difficult. So we need to find tricks so that he still keeps the power because he's the boss. He has to run the classroom. And uh, that's another one where we use another lamp. And as you notice, the color of the lamp is different. Why? Why would the color of the computer have any impact on learning? 
you eat so much fondue in Switzerland that your brain is so damaged that you believe that the color of a computer has any effect on learning? <laughs> Why? Why is that important to a different color of this computer? It's a stupid reason. Just a teacher can say the blue team, the red team, the white team. Okay? So here, the color of the lamp was just has nothing to do on the individual use of the technology, neither on the team, but at the level of the classroom orchestration, of managing the classroom. It was just a little thing that helped classroom management. So uh, one thing that we quite often believe when we design things is that the technology has an effect on the learning. The technology has absolutely no effect. Okay? Robots have no effect for learning. Put a robot, a child who sleeps, he learns nothing. The proof. The robot has no effect. What effect is the activity of the child? MOOCs have no effect on learning. Give a MOOC to your dog, you will see. It has no effect on learning. Good MOOCs are good for learning. Bad MOOCs. We don't have, but bad MOOCs, there are some of them. So the technology itself has no effect. What if the effect is also always a learning activity. But the point here that if you want the learning activity to run well, like if you want the students to predict, spontaneously only the good teams predict. If you want them to predict, that, that you need a teacher to orchestrate this learning activity. So here is another example for, for carpenters. The teacher of carpentry asks us, could you teach statics? You know, there is a roof and uh, which beam are being compressed or an extension. Without mathematics, intuitive statics. The professor of civil engineering told me, no, okay, it's impossible. Static is mathematics. But here, you see, they build, uh, they decide to put uh, solar panels on snow or a jacuzzi in the roof or on the ceiling, and they will see which beam are being compressed, which beam are in extension. Um, maybe they will add something bigger. So we say, oh, what if I change wood? Maybe if I buy more expensive wood from my roof, uh, then maybe I can build a jack put, add a jacuzzi. So again, augmented reality, super cool. Can I perceive in a roof structure without mathematics which beam uh, being compressed with an extension? No kid will learn statics by playing with that. No. Humanity took thousands of years to discover Newton's law. You can not expect, you should not expect an apprentice or any human being to learn the same thing in 20 minutes by even by playing with a super cool application. They don't spontaneously discover, but they are ready to discover, they are ready to understand. This, there is this notion of readiness to learn. It means that if the teacher would give a, a lecture, the students will understand the word, but they will mean nothing. They understand, but why, why? So if they try, if they fail, they try again. They, then, when the teacher tells them, then it makes sense. And there is notion of, of a time for telling uh, by John's, John Swansford and Daniel Schwartz. A time for telling. At this moment, where they're ready, because they've been playing around, then you can give a short lecture. Then the short lecture is efficient, not if you gave it before. So I call it semi-constructivism. Hmm? So Alf Piaget, you know. Piaget he, he was not really talking about guided discovery in the classroom. He was talking about how oh, kids develop some mental schemes over years, and these mental schemes are, are very basic, like, yes, apu, ako, apu, ako, apu. Now, a, a child believes that when an object disappears, it does not exist. This is why he cries when his mom disappears. And after five years of ako, apu, ako, then he say, hey, Dad, I understand now. These objects still exist, even if I don't see the object. This is Piaget. We, we learn over years this kind of mental schemes. But we don't learn Newton's law in 20 minutes. We can be ready to, send, to make sense to what the teacher would say. So there is a time for telling. Now, OK, if we want to empower a teacher, how can we help him to develop peda rich pedagogical scenarios? So let's take again the example of simulation. I show you two simulations based on augmented reality, but you all use some kind of simulation tools probably in new research or in new schools. 
how do you design a nice lesson if you think about orchestration? Hmm? The basic thing we think, oh, yeah, the learners have to simulate, okay? But we know from Tom de Jong that 42% research done here in, 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 in the Netherlands, that 42% of the teenagers, that, or even university students, they don't spontaneously make, uh, uh, formulate an hypothesis. So the hypothetical deductive re reasoning cycle does not work well. So maybe we should first ask them to predict, as we did, okay. But we also know that um, they are very bad at interpreting the, the graph produced by your simulation. A lot of mistakes. So we should do some activity, not expect them that they will nicely interpret the data. We should have some activity there. And maybe we have this time for telling. So maybe at the end we give a from lecture. And if you remember your first course on education, Ausubel, there was this idea of advanced organizer that help, that will guide the discovery by pre-activating some cognitive, pre-activating some cognitive structure. This is so we'll do some introduction. Cool. And then you say, well, uh, maybe I could have some collaborative learning, social cognitive conflict. People learn when they have to repair the misunderstanding or their disagreements. So I will ask some cognitive activities. And then, because you still believe in Bloom and mastery learning, will be, oh, it would be nice to have also some exercise, individual exercise. Okay, oh la 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 la, what do I do with this? That's a, well, that's a nightmare. What do I do with this kind of thing? So do I organize my lesson? So I propose to organize them like that. There are three social planes, individual activities, team activities, class activities. Very simple. And then you can place these activities on dif different planes. So start by a short lesson and then individual production, team argumentation on different hypotheses. Then they run the simulation. They compare the results. They try to interpret the data. The teacher gets all the data, gave his lecture, and at the end he gave them exercise. So that's a very simple way to uh, put some order into a kind of uh, a complex design. So the things are left to right is the time and vertically is the social plane. Vygotsky called that social plane. It has nothing to do with a plane, with an aircraft, but I put an aircraft uh, icon to confuse you a little <laughs> bit. So you will remember that the plane is not a plane because I confused you. This is uh, germane cognitive load. Okay. So um, that's what I call an orchestration graph. It's a sequence of activity that are forming a consistent workflow. So what do we mean by workflow is that, for instance, here, what we can do when they've made individual prediction, we can say, hey, let's make pairs, let's make pair, let pairs of students with different hypotheses. So the first they make an hypothesis, then we find in the classroom automatically people who made opposite of hypothesis, and then we ask them to work together, social cognitive conflict. Or here we can collect all the prediction and all the results so that the teacher in, in his lecture will discuss the production of the students. So uh, this orchestration graph actually is a data flow where data from one activity are being transferred to the next activity. It looks like, a, uh, it doesn't look like a technological system when you're in the classroom, but in the background, if you want to make automatically pairs of students who disagree, you need a bit of a, a, a workflow. So here is an example of, two examples of graph I use in my own class. So, well, here the topic is about drugs in marathon, but that was just an example. You take a, a class, you ask people to fill a questionnaire, no right or wrong answer, but different opinions. Based on that, you build a map where you plot the opinions of people. Based on their opinion on each answer in the questionnaire, they have some X and Y value. So you make a social map with the names of the people, and then you say you, and you, you disagree, so you will go together and answer the same questionnaire in pairs, where they see the individual answers, and then the system will collect all the, for the debriefing activity, all the answer that the lecturer me will use in his lecture, and finally, they have to write a summary. That's an example of or orchestration graph. We call it the argue graph. Um, one example. Um, now, what happened in this graph? You know, when, when you have music, it, 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 the, the system says pianissimo, allegro, ma non presto, ma non troppo, ma non troppo. Allegre. Excuse me. Allegre. 
Manantropo. It's uh, he has some. It's not just a technical thing. There is some tension. What is the tension here? Well, if you take at the end of the act activity, if you take a class like that, people assert. If you take the level of agreement among the people in a room, if I would randomly pair you, there will be some average level of misunderstanding. What I do with this technology by making pairs of opposite opinion, I remove, uh, I put down the level of shared understanding so that they will make more effort. It will be more difficult to reach because you start from lower. Instead of having somebody who disagree more or less with you, you have somebody with whom we maximize the agreement. So it's more difficult to agree. We make it more difficult to agree. Um, quite many people define collaborative learning as a process of um, building a shared understanding. No, collaboration is that. But collaboration, collaborative learning is how much you have to make effort, explain, reformulate, argue, disagree, how much verbal elaboration you have to put to be able to build a shared understanding. And it's not the least collaborative learning as in psycholinguistics. It's, it's, it's the verbal effort that will create learning. And this is related to the German cognitive load. Maybe one example of that. Look at these two guys. Yeah, both men. Which one is going to win the race next Sunday? One is super cool, easy, he enjoy life, and we always say, well, learning should be fun, should be easy, and so on. But which one is going to win the race? The one that is easy, fun, and so on, or the one who is sweating? Engage, he's engaged. Okay, you got the point. Um, this is exactly the same what I did in my graph. I made the slope more vertical. I make the slope steeper because it, learning does not come for free. It has to make an effort. Look at this coach. Is that a good coach? Yes. Yeah, he makes his life more difficult. The guy <laughs> cannot run. <laughs> huh? You said that, that, that's, a, that's, that's a bastard. I mean, he, what a very good guy. You, a teacher would say, do that. A teacher would say that. You say, hey, what a bad teacher. No, he is making the life of the, of the, um, of the, of the runner um, faster. The learner is motivated, right, and uh, that's for sure. <laughs> so let me uh, just skip one step. So in, in instructional psychology, people discriminate three types of, of cognitive load. The intrinsic load, if you run a marathon, it's difficult. OK, nothing to. Uh, the extrinsic load, that's something that is totally useless, will not improve. And the, in, the German cognitive load here, the guy is running by pulling a tire, that's a kind of uh, things we are looking for. It's not because it's difficult that, um, that they learn. It's because it's the right level of demand. It's demanding, not just painful for the sake of suffering. It's the right kind of pain that you need to have. So this is called a German cognition. For me, it's like an elastic. You pull them down a little bit, and then something will happen. So let me give you a last example. That's my class this year. Uh, it's a class on HCI, human-computer interaction, and at some point I have to teach interaction style. Whether when you do a task, it's easier to have a form, an online form, a drag and drop, a command line, you know, what is the best interaction style? And of course I could give a lecture, but I am a semi-constructivist, so I want them to feel by themselves first. So what do I do? I say, well, listen, you see this interface, please order four train tickets. Yeah, please order a standard return second class ticket from Basel to Zurich with a bike. And this is called a window icons menu pull down, so it's a traditional interface. Interface one, interaction style two, they, have, they do the same thing, four more train tickets with, um, with um, a, a form style. Interface three uh, with a drag and drop, same task, and then four more tickets with a language command from Lausanne to Davos, standard C2 return. Okay, so uh, for, uh, I have a class with like here, but what, about 100 people, each of them open his laptop and has to order 16 train tickets um, for the sake of the lessons uh, in random order. So of course, because I want to compare the performance in this four interface, some of them start with this one, some of them start with this one, and so on, so on, this is randomized, okay? It's not fun, 
ordering 16 train tickets, it's not fun. Uh, some people do it all their life. Uh, my students do it for 20 minutes, so I have to encourage them. There is a, a scoreboard, and the winner gets a Toblerone. Uh, <laughs> this is orchestration. You have to, you have to uh, invest a bit of energy so that it works. This is a time management tool. I will mention it in, in a few minutes. And then, then we have the orchestration graph. So then I ask each of them individually, which one did you like the most among the four interaction styles you tried? The answer. Then um, I put in pair people who disagree, people who did not prefer the same interface as in the previous graph. And they have uh, the answer from here from Ryan, the answer from Jenny, and they can move that up and down and up to the moment where they agree, and they have a chat. Why a chat there in the same room? Yes, but this is a lecture all in this university. If I start to say, hey, you should now move and go to uh, Jenny, you should go no, move and chat with, with, uh, with Ryan, I will, lose, I will lose five minutes. And I cannot lose twice five minutes in my class. So uh, they use a chat. But it was funny. At some point, there was not a single noise in the classroom. I thought it would be a mess. No, not a single noise. You could just hear the noise of the keys on the... So they were really engaged, so they argued. They argued without knowing the data. So they argued, well, that, I like this one, I don't like this one. Without having seen what was the, how many mistakes they have done for the four interaction style, how much time it took. And then we, we take the data and we have a second argumentation where no, they have to argue again with the same person, but by viewing the data about their own performance. So it's, let's say, Database argumentation. First, it's just based on the opinion. Second, on, on, on the opinion. And, and then I lecture. There is a time for telling. I lecture. In my own lecture, the system has collected all the data, like what is the mean number of errors for uh, the different tra train tickets for the four interaction style, and what is the time for the first ticket, second ticket, third ticket. So that's an orchestration graph. Instead of just saying, well, try a different thing, I've orchestrated that. I found people, the first I give them experience, and then so f for having them to reflect, I find people with contradicting experience, and they have to argue, and then they have to argue with data, and then I explain these data. That's an orchestration graph. And also, here I can show them that was their opinion when they were answering individually, and how much the opinion has changed when they were individually answering or collectively, when they were in individual or in pairs, and then we can discuss that in the classroom. So this, uh, the, the actual look and feel, this is a didactic version of the graph. On the system, it looks like that. Um, uh, Stian Haklev developed a platform called FROC, means fabricating and running orchestration graphs that uh, operate all these things uh, in, in the classroom. Uh, so that's me, you see the graph is running and I'm there in front, you don't see but there are 100 students in front of me. Okay, now one little thing in orchestration that you probably all experience. At the, for the first activity, so they have to, train, to order 16 train tickets and um, I say, okay, you have, uh, you have uh, eight minutes. Then at eight minutes, let's say 80% of them have finished. What do I do as a teacher? What would you do? You say, well, sorry, I said eight minutes. I lose 20% of my class. All right, let's wait two more minutes so that this 20 person can finish. But yeah, but 80% of the students are waiting their time. So, um, what, and you know, when students do nothing, you lose control of your class. Huh? Mm -hmm. They open the email, WhatsApp, whatever. Huh? So should you extend by one minute, or two minutes, so can you predict when, if one more minute will give you 10% more students or 20 or 30 percent? Yes, we can. So the, the, my team developed this, this super tool where in blue is those who have started. It was another experiment. And in red, those who have finished. So can I, I can try to predict that when the things is getting flat, then it's no more useful to wait um, to wait for more students. So I, it helps me managing time, saying, Pierre, if you wait two more minutes, you have many people losing time, and you will get maybe two more students with you. So, jump. So, this is called a time extension gain. For every minute more, how many seconds 
students more will complete the task. And we found in another class of me, in another task very similar, that the completion time was pretty linear. So we used, that's kind of very simple, except those who drop off, the completion time is pretty linear, which allows us to make quite accurate prediction. This is a prediction of an activity that lasts 10 minutes. It's a prediction, the blue line is, the, the black line is the real time that for completion. Blue is how we could predict after three minutes only. Green is uh, five, red is seven. You see that we, we are quite, it's quite easy to predict when they will finish the task. So you can actually help the teacher managing time by giving a little thing like that that, that is displayed on the screen. So here, for instance, they, they computed something more called classroom satisfaction that at some point you are satisfied if you complete, but you are unsatisfied if you wait for nothing. So at some point here, you can reduce time from this to this to maximize the satisfaction of your learners. Okay, and at the end of the talk, uh, just a, a small bonus to, uh, to finish. This is uh, the last baby in my lab. This is called Cellulo. It's a small robot like that. There you see it ups upside down. It has two features. One, when it moves, um, a, a normal robot like now, if it makes that and you make that, you break the engine. With this one, there is a, a, a smart trick that if you pull the robot in the wrong direction, you don't break the engine. So it gives you tactile feedback, haptic feedback. You can feel the forces in the robot. And um, the second feature is that below the robot, there is a camera and uh, the paper sheets we use, we print a very small pattern that is almost invisible by human eye, but that the robot sees. And thanks to that, the robot can locate itself by a quarter millimeter on the sheet of paper. So the intelligence is in the paper. It's a very basic robot. But for every learning activity, we have a different sheet of paper. The robot recognizes where, well, tells to the system, I'm on this sheet, on this position, and the system can uh, tell him what to do. This was an activity where they have to predict the, 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 where high pressure and low pressure points are all on Europe. Wind goes from high pressure to low pressure, and uh, they would play with these robots on a table and feel the wind uh, in the um, in their hands as in order to find high pressure and low pressure. So these are uh, school students who are here that, that are trying to find out where the wind is pushing. So they feel they feel the force of the robot, which is here representing the wind pushing a balloon across Europe. Okay, and then the guy who invented that invented a super cool thing that I want to show you. This is swarm tangible haptic interaction. You move one robot and you produce a collective behavior. Not sure what we can teach with that, but it's, <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's also okay to have fun from time to time. Huh? Uh, we should not always be serious. We are a researcher, we can explore. Well, he did one activity where this is an, uh, um, uh, um, the atoms of an object, and if when, the, when it is a solid, the atoms stick together. But if you start eating the solid, eventually it will become a liquid. So the binding between the atoms will be uh, weaker. And uh, if you start eating more, eventually it will become a gas, and so on. OK. So I just um, finished. I wanted to say that we have opened in Lausanne one year ago an incubator with 30 ed tech startups. Uh, we have 70, no, it's kind of precise. The number of ed tech companies, I'm sure it's the same in, in most of our countries. A lot of small companies, very small, two, three person, no visibility, so we decided to put them together and give them this visibility. Uh, we do also do a lot of learning analytics research in my class, up in my room, in my lab, uh, applying machine learning to online education, but also to face-to-face -face situation, like predicting the level of attention of a classroom. Uh, in terms of MOOCs, as Lorenzo mentioned, we produce 80 MOOCs, 2 million people uh, who registered to our university. Uh, we have this small robot that we've sold 35,000 of them to school. So there is something bizarre about EPFL. We have a school of technology. We don't have a school of education. But we have all these things happening, robots, uh, um, 
MOOCs, the incubator, and so on, that we have opened uh, very recently, the EPFL Center for Learning Science. Thank you for your attention.